Sarah. Um, and again, if you guys want to um, share your videos, if you're happy to, um, I think it makes for a bit more of an engaging presentation. I just want to kind of gauge the crowd participation and um, seeing if people are laughing at my jokes or not. Um, so um, if you have any questions as we go through, feel free to sing out. Um, if not, if you guys are used to using Zoom, obviously you can mute your microphone and you can um, take that on and off mute when you want to talk. So um, throughout the presentation, um, I would just encourage you to, to try and mute your own microphone unless you have a question, just to try and reduce the background noise. Um, but obviously, if you have a question, feel free to just sing out and, and we'll address those as we go through. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen with you guys. So I'm working off my iPad today and it should come up in just a moment. So. We're going to do a presentation today. Um, we've gone, been going through some case rounds and we've had a lot of feedback um, talking about lameness examination and um, different tips and tricks and things like that. So I actually had a presentation um, that I had previously done um, and so I thought I'd run through that with you and it's titled White Coat Fever um, and how to perform a meaningful orthopedic examination. And I think this is um, really an interesting area and the, the longer I have been looking at animals and, and doing these examinations, the more I think I get from just observing visually what's going on with the patient. Um, I often find that when I go to put my hands on the patient, um, they react very differently depending on the dog's personality. And it can sometimes be really hard to make a meaningful interpretation of the, the findings from that. So the more I do this, the, the more I pay attention to the animal before I actually touch them. Um, I think we can get a lot of information that's really meaningful um, in doing that. So we'll go straight through and, and get started. So this lecture, again, if you have any questions, um, any comments, anything um, you want to ask me, just feel free to, to fire away. Um, I'll just work out if I can get the comment section up. Bear with me for one moment. I just have to get the chat up there. And then if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to find them in the chat section. I think that um, we'll start there when I go back to sharing my screen. So I just go back to share that now. How do I turn off? I'll get that up there. So you can see the chat. Uh, window at the same time as how do we get? So yeah, I can see it now. So if you guys have any questions, um, when you do post questions in the chat um, box, it is um, possible for you to select whether you send them to the group or whether you send them just privately. Um, definitely encourage you to send the messages to the group if you're happy to, and that way um, everyone else can see the, the questions there, and, and you can um, just search through the different menus in Zoom to find that chat box. So we're going to get started with this lecture. I should run for about an hour, so if you need to duck out early, um, feel free to do that. If you want to interrupt me, um, that's what this is about. Um, and these slides are really just there for some talking points and to kind of drive the discussion. So we'll get into it. So the plan for today is we're going to go through the goals of the orthopedic examination. We're going to think about the kind of three steps, the three really critical steps that I look at um, when I'm performing a, a lameness workup. And those things include looking at the signal in history, we're going to look at the physical examination. Um, we're going to look at our diagnostics as the last step of that. Um, we're going to look at some specific kind of tips and tricks, looking at different joint manipulations um, and some comments there um, that hopefully will give you some information you can take into your practice and, and start to implement straight away. So, you know, what's the goal of the orthopedic examination? And obviously, you know, the, the, the goal is to try and make a diagnosis. Um, and in order to do that, we need to, first of all, find which leg is problematic, which one is the lame leg. Um, and then from there, we need to actually try and then pinpoint um, which is the problematic joint. And I think a lot of that is easier said than done. You know, I think oftentimes it's easier to find the effective limb. Um, we've got some different tricks to help you do that. But in terms of finding a problematic joint, that can be more challenging. And there's challenges when we're looking at both the front leg and the back leg in doing that. And 
from your the examination, you should be able to get very close to actually having a definitive diagnosis. Um, if you go through the steps and, and don't miss anything, then in most situations, you should have a pretty good idea as to what the problem is before you actually move on to the next step, which is um, the diagnostic imaging. Um, one of the other really important goals is make sure you don't get bit. Um, and you know, I'm sure we've all been there in many situations where we're looking at a dog and the owner say, oh, you know, the dog is nice and friendly and you know, it won't be a problem. And then all of a sudden there's teeth flashing past your face as you're ducking for cover. Um, so always just have that in your mind when you're looking at these guys. If you come into a sore spot, um, certainly keep that in mind and, and be aware of that. I just wanted to run through this case. Um, this is a really common situation for us. Um, we do a lot of orthopedic surgery in a hospital. We see a lot of cases referred for total hip replacement. Um, and I just put this case up here as a really classic example of a situation when um, a situation when we see something on x-rays, we haven't really performed a thorough examination and we just really hang on to that radiographic finding as the, the source of the problem. And so this is a dog, um, he presented with a uh, right back leg lameness. Um, we've taken x-rays of his hips here. This is the first thing that was done and then the, the patient was referred to us for an assessment. And certainly when we look at this, the right hip has a lot of um, arthritic change. Um, so in this section here, we can see that there's arthritis. That certainly could be a cause for this dog's discomfort. On clinical examination, though, we found that he was uncomfortable in his hip, um, certainly, but really his biggest problem was actually in his knee. And he had um, cranial jaw when we palpated that knee. And when we took x-rays of his knee, we can see quite clearly that this dog has um, a large amount of effusion in that joint. He also has some arthritis and some osteophytes starting to develop. And so this dog has got a cranial crucial ligament rupture. And rather than doing a total hip replacement, we went ahead and we did a, um, a TPLO, okay? And this is a classic situation where a complete orthopedic examination wasn't performed and we've just made a diagnosis based on imaging only and there's been a disconnect between what we see on the imaging and what we see um, clinically. And so in this situation, um, when we have both the hip and the knee affected, they both can be contributing to the dog's overall clinical picture. However, we generally, in this specific instance, we're working the ground up. So we'll fix the knee first, and then we'll come back and we'll look at doing something about the cycle after that point. What do you want done with those pallets in the corner out there? Are you um, just throwing them out? Or? Yeah. Okay. Charles, can you mute your microphone, please? There's a pin out on the street, possibly. Um, and so the next thing we're going to look at then is um, the three steps of the lameness workup. And, and the, the three steps that I go through, I, I do this in every single situation, and um, I really think that you have to take care not to, um, to miss any of these steps. The first one is to look closely at the, the history and the signalment. Um, we'll talk through that in just a moment. Second thing is that visual observation and physical examination. And I would say, as I mentioned at the start, that I'm putting more and more weight on that visual observation and really trying not to discount that as we go through. Um, the third thing that we're going to look at um, as part of this workup is this specific diagnostic test. So we're not going to focus too much on that in this particular lecture. We're going to focus more on steps one and steps two. So when we look at the cinema in the history, um, again, it's important to be consistent and not to cut corners. Um, if you do that, you know, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to miss things, okay? Um, I still remember one of our lecturers in the uni, a guy by the name of Peter Mansell, saying that more mistakes are made by not looking than not knowing. And I think that's absolutely correct. And almost every time when I um, still sort of scratching my head and wondering what's going on, if I go back to first principles and, and you know, look at the animal completely with a fresh set of eyes, then we can often identify exactly what the problem is. And as you mentioned already, when we go through this process um, and we look at this in the history, it should be able to give you pretty close to an answer as to what the problem is in about 90% of cases. Um, and if not a definitive diagnosis, you should be pretty close. So what clues can you get from the signalman? Um, the first thing I'm going to be looking at when I'm looking through the history is I'm looking at the age of the patient. You know, is it a younger dog, an older dog? Um, I don't have absolute numbers on this, but when we're looking at younger animals, and in that I mean you know, dogs less than a year of age, around that number, one year to 18 months of age. In younger animals, things like elbow dysplasia, uh, OCD of the various joints can come up. We're looking at glenoid dysplasia, panosteitis, hypertrophy, osteodystrophy, all those things are certainly possibilities and things that are rolling around in my mind as to, to possible causes of lameness. If we're looking at older patients, then 
it's unlikely that we're going to see those um, those diseases. We might see the um, the end result of those diseases, which is osteoarthritis, um, but um, and we might need to treat that, but we might have missed the boat on, on the actual um, the early diagnosis of something like elbow dysplasia. In older patients, you can also see neoplasia um, that occurs in, in the musculoskeletal system. Osteosarcoma is common in the skeleton. We can see nerve root tumors that occur. We can sometimes see um, hemangiosarcoma occurring in the muscles. Um, and so um, those are the things that we want to have in our mind. If you've got tumors around the joint, then the synovial tumors and cystic sarcomas and things like that are also a possibility. In older patients, we often start to see more of these wear and tear type injuries. Um, and if you're looking at the front leg, you look at things like medial shoulder instability. Um, and that's a, a relatively common finding in older, very active dogs as the, the medial structures, the medial stabilizers of the shoulder joint start to wear out with time and age and overuse. We then move on to clues from the signalment, um, looking specifically at the breeds. Um, you know, if you're looking at a golden uh, retriever, if you're looking at a German Shepherd, Labrador, and his mountain dog, again, things like um, elbow dysplasia, OCD become very, very common, a fellow their hip dysplasia. Um, if you're looking at um, miniature dogs and miniature poodles, things like congenital shoulder wax, this is really focusing on the front leg. If you're looking at greyhounds, we think of things like pad forms. Um, interestingly, in greyhounds, these guys don't get crucial ruptures. And so if you see a greyhound and you're diagnosing a cruciate rupture, um, I would very much urge you to look very closely um, for the tumour that will be in the uh, proximal tibia or the distal femur. Um, greyhounds are overrepresented for getting osteosarcomas. Um, also, pay close attention to make sure they don't have a pad form. Um, that's a, a very um, relatively common condition in greyhounds and something that can make them look like they've got a broken bone. They can be really, really painful. Um, so have a good look at the, the pad there. If you're diagnosing cruciate, just have in your mind that it's, it's almost unheard of um, for a greyhound to, to have a cruciate rupture because most likely going to be something else going on. In spaniels, um, and particularly in the UK and Europe, um, they can get incomplete ossification of the humeral condyles um, as a breed specific problem. We don't see that very commonly here, certainly not to the extent that we see that in the UK. So again, we've looked at the um, the age, we've looked at the breed, um, and putting those things together, we can start to build a picture and start to get some idea of where we might be looking and, and what the problem might actually be. The next thing that I think is um, really, really important and, and a skill that you develop with time is to get clues from your history. And this is um, where it's important to ask questions. And if you want to ask questions, not only do you want to ask the questions, you want to ask good questions, okay? And it's always hard sometimes when you have a, a husband and wife team or a couple come in um, and they have different opinions on um, their answers to these questions. And so you have to add a level of interpretation over the top of that as well. But the things that I think are really important to ask, uh, you know, when did the lameness begin? Was there an inciting incident that triggered the lameness? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Is it static? Um, is it intermittent or is it continuous? When is it worse? Um, is it worse when the animal first gets up? Is it worse when the animal goes for a run? Um, is it something that the animal warms out of? Um, you know, all those things are really, really important. Um, and they can give you clues as to what might be the underlying um, problem in the particular situation. And I think going through that and getting a consistent approach to those questions is, is really, really essential. Other things to think about, other questions to ask, um, you know, what medications have you been using? Um, or have you tried? Um, has there been any response to those medications? Um, is there any spontaneous vocalisation? You know, a patient that has um, spontaneous vocalisation that's lying down all of a sudden it's yelping in pain, more often than not, that's going to be related to a nerve type problem and very commonly that will be related to something like this about the disc rupture, the dog's also got a front leg lameness, um, or potentially nerve root tumours and things like that. Um, so spontaneous vocalisation should be a good clue for, for what might be going on. Other you know, health concerns with the patient you're dealing with, um, has there ever been lameness in any other limb, any other difficulty using the stairs? Um, those things are important. They may not be important necessarily for the lameness you're looking at in a particular leg, but can be really important um, in trying to get a global assessment of the patient and working out overall exactly how you're going to manage this patient. Because when we're dealing with lameness in older animals, it's not uncommon for them to have disease affecting multiple limbs. And we have to make a plan for how we deal with that. I mean, what is the most pressing issue for that patient? If we've got disease, for instance, in two joints in the same limb, we have to then think about you know, what's the relative contribution of each of those problems um, 
to that particular patient. And that can sometimes be a very difficult thing to try and determine. Um, other questions that I ask commonly, you know, um, any difficulties getting up and down out of um, bed or from lying down, um, any difficulties getting out of the car, any other behaviour changes, um, and whether the, the owners are actually said anything else about that. And all these things kind of seem like you know, a no-brainer, but unless you actually ask the question, sometimes um, you might overlook a piece of information that's quite important. So once you've gone through that, um, I would encourage you to stop at that point and resist the temptation um, to grab onto the animal and start pulling on joints and pulling on legs. Um, the physical examination is an important part of this, but I would really encourage you to stop at this point, take a breath, um, and observe the animal as much as you can. And so while I'm asking all these questions to the owner, um, I'm often sitting down in the consult room, all the stuff happening with COVID-19 at the moment, I'm now standing outside in the cold, watching animals walk around as we ask these questions. Um, but I'm observing the animal the whole time, and I'm, I'm just passively watching, seeing how things are. Often it takes a few minutes for the animal to settle down in the consult room, but once they've settled, you can start to see subtle changes. You know, they might start to offload a leg, they might start to sit and they don't sit squarely on the back legs. Um, they might start to have a hard time getting up or getting down. So all of these things are really important observations to know that. And this physical examination process that I go through, um, you go to this point at home, you're going to go through passive observation, you're going to go through hands-on examination. And that passive observation looks at both the posture of the animal and the gait of the animal and trying to get as many clues as you can from, from those particular aspects. Once we get to the hands-on exam part, we're going to look at the like, neurologic exam and an orthopedic examination to make sure that we're not missing anything there. And once you, it seems like a lot of work to do for each case, but once you get into a routine and get into a habit, it sort of can be formed on very, very rapidly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to go through the orthopedic examination, specifically looking at the um, general principles um, and, and looking at specific manipulations and some kind of tips and tricks for both the thoracic end and the, the pelvic end. So I want you to remember, and if there's three things that you take out of this lecture, um, this presentation, three things to take from your clinic um, straight away, these, things, these three things are gonna be the number one thing is to observe the animal. Um, so we're looking at just um, how they're standing, what their posture is. Um, the second thing is that we wanna make a video of them moving and to do the gait assessment. And so I do a gait assessment just visually, um, but almost every time now I have a smartphone and I take a video of the patient and it's really, really um, great, especially for subtle lameness, to be able to look at that video, slow it down, and make an assessment of um, whether there's a head bob or not, which, which leg might be affected. It can also be a really great way to um, get the owners on board with the fact that you picked up a problem that they don't necessarily see. Because if they can actually visually identify it with you, then, um, then you can have a much more meaningful discussion about what the options are for trying to treat them. The third thing that we're going to do is then make sure we're doing a systematic approach to the orthopedic and neurologic examination. So there's three things. Number one, observe the animal. Um, number two, make a video. And then number three is when we're actually going to um, go ahead and put our hands on the patient. So looking through then at this passive observation of posture and gait, what does that mean? There are clues to, you know, things to look for with standing posture. If a dog has a sore leg, they're going to try to offload that leg. They're going to try and take their leg away from, so the weight off that, that leg that's actually sore. And so some things to look for, a lot of this is intuitive, but just to run through it. You know, when they shift their weight um, in the situation um, here, number, letter A, they're going to take their weight um, away from the limb that's actually sore. And so um, in this situation, um, we can see that the, um, the head will move over, with the, um, the weight bearing axis of the, the patient will move over onto the unaffected leg and they'll be standing off the, the one that's painful. In situation B, we can see that that dog is actually starting to shift his weight backwards, his center of gravity backwards, and the way he does that is by lifting his head up. Okay, he lifts his head up, and sometimes he'll actually tuck the back legs underneath him a little bit. Um, and so in doing that, they're trying to offload the, the front legs. In the situation in C, um, he's dropping his head down and shifting his um, weight-bearing axis cranially or rostrally and in doing that, he's going to take his weight off his back legs um, and put it over onto his front legs. Okay, and these are subtle things that you can look for. And again, as I'm discussing the questions with the owners and, and getting a history, these are the things that I'm just trying to observe. Um, 
these are some photographs of, of postural changes that we see. Um, the German Shepherd on the left. Um, we have a case here that had um, significant medial coronary disease. This is a young dog about six months old. Um, that dog had an arthroscopy and had um, large fragments removed. Um, in the centre here, we have a greyhound. This greyhound had a pack horn. Um, but again, you can see that the offloading um, and holding that leg up um, is what we're, we're trying to identify. And on the right there, we've got a Labrador. And this again is a very classic situation for a Labrador with a sore elbow. Um, they're offloading the, within a little bit, but what we can also see is there's that external rotation of the foot um, and kind of that abduction uh, of the elbow with the external rotation of the foot. That's a very classic sign of um, a dog with a sore elbow. Body posture, um, on the left we've got a patient who is shifting his weight forwards, um, trying to take his weight off the back legs. Um, we're also making observations about muscle mass and size. And you can see here on this dog on the right hand side that we've got um, some muscle atrophy. And often that muscle atrophy and asymmetry between muscle mass can be a, a really useful clue as to, to which they might be affected um, or have been a problem with size. Too. And that's something that we're going to look for visually and then later on we're going to try and assess that with palpation as well. Um, looking more at postural changes, um, we've got a fairly normal situation on the left compared to um, the patient on the right, which is a Labrador with a um, sore hips and that dog is again trying to shift his weight forwards um, with a fairly narrow stance in his back legs um, to try and take that weight off those um, back legs and, and ultimately off his hips in that situation. Looking at the back legs specifically, um, we have a couple of different scenarios here. So um, in those images on the left-hand side, we've got the normal situation. We're looking at the distance between the feet here. Um, we're also looking at the um, shape of the pelvis. And we're trying to just see how things change as we get this displays. So on the left, these hips are sitting nicely within the acetabulum. On the right, we can see um, that as these hips are upside out, um, we get a change in the shape here of the pelvis when we look at it from, the, from, the back, from behind. Um, and we can see that the feet start to change in their position as well. But specifically the hips on the, the right hand set of images. Early on when um, we see these cases in dysplasia and there's laxity and the hips are popping in and out, we have this situation over here where the patient will try and stand with the hips in a relatively wide based stance. And in doing that, we're effectively trying to keep their hips um, you know, reduce location. As things get worse and, and um, there's more discomfort there, they don't want the hips going in and out necessarily, so they'll actually stand with more of a base and alley conformation to try and keep those hips in a more subluxated position. So if you're seeing this situation where the dog's either base wide or base narrow, then that can be a clue that there might be a problem with the hip, there might be an issue with laxity then, and we should be having a good look at those hips to see if there's a problem. And that's often an issue in a, in a younger patient um, when it's a hip specific. So moving then on to the gait assessment, um, we're going to look at um, patients as they walk um, around and I like to look at them walking in a straight line, I like to look at them walking in a circle um, and we're going to look at them at a trot and it's often interesting to compare the walk and the trot because dogs have a, a harder time um, faking it um, or pretending like the leg's okay either when they're walking very, very slowly to walk um, or potentially um, when they're trotting. Um, that's often when we'll see changes like a head bob or a hip height um, and we're assessing them is at that um, trot speed. The next thing we're going to look at is um, using stairs um, and how will they go up and down stairs. Um, we don't do it in every situation but that can be a useful way to try and ascertain um, whether there's a problem in the back of the front leg. Often if there's a hip problem they'll have a hard time wanting to extend those hips and go up the stairs. If they've got a thoracic wing problem sometimes they'll have a really hard time going down the stairs. Um, the other thing that I find really useful is if you're having a hard time trying to diagnose the problem that you're only really adamant that there is an issue at home, um, but you're really not able to piece everything together really nicely in a way that fits, is to just get the owners to take the video of the patient at home. Um, because once they get to the hospital, there's a, inherently a lot of stress um, and a lot of cortisol flying around, a lot of adrenaline, and that adrenaline um, in the system can make it really, really difficult um, to see exactly what the patient's doing at home. If you have a dog that has some arthritis, you know, the owners report a lameness when they get up first thing in the morning, they get out of it, um, they're bad when they first get up. But when they come to the hospital, they're completely fine. Um, and you can't see any sign of lameness because that 
basal level of osteoarthritis treating pain is often not really, really dramatic and, and you know, having a large amount of cortisol and adrenaline in the system is enough to overcome that in dogs. I always say to owners, you know, dogs are pretty good at getting that adrenaline in their system and getting their leg attached and actually just getting on with it and looking okay. So that's something to, to factor in there for sure. But if you have the owners take the video at home, then that can certainly be useful um, in trying to um, assess what they're like in their natural environment without the effects of the distress in the um, adrenaline. We've got a couple of videos here um, to just highlight about um, you know, taking a video on, and the effects of actually slowing those down. So hopefully we can see those come through. But if we could get him, so you know, I know he's still lame, if we could get um, him like this, audio no pain, well. no medication, it's a slight lameness, it's not brilliant, but... So if we go through this, I might be able to... Oops. This is this on my iPad, so it's hard to... Make sure you show that on there. What I'm going to do is just go back to my computer. Just bear with me for a moment, guys. So I'm just going to stop sharing on that one. Sorry. And I'm just going to pull this up on my laptop. Make the point with these videos, I think they're quite important. Look at that. So let me just share my screen again. Yeah. So can you guys all see that now? Just give me a thumbs up or something like that. Kirish, can you see my screen again with those videos perfect? So I'm just gonna start playing that again. So on the left here, we've got, I'm putting them all at the same time. So on the right hand side here, we've got a dog with a front leg laying this. And as we look at this in normal speed, you know, you can see that there's a lane this air. Um, and some of you guys can probably tell me which leg is the lame one. Um, but if we actually slow that video down, it can become much more obvious which leg is the problematic leg. So if we look at this in slow motion, you can see we're looking for the head bob and the patient will lift the head up when the sore foot hits the ground. So it goes down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And so in this leg, when, so this patient, when the right head looks the, the right leg hits the ground, the patient's head comes up, and so we can see quite clearly as a right front leg lane is there. So when you look at it at normal speed, you know, when you in tune what you're doing, you can see it. But, you know, if you, I, in the way I kind of look at this, I actually try and lift my head up and down with the patients. And as I'm doing this, I'm thinking to myself, up, 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 up. And as I'm saying up, I'm trying to look at which foot hits the ground. If it's hard to tell on the video, we can slow it down and go up, 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 up. And you can see that as that right hit, that right foot hits the ground, that's the, a really nice way to have a look at that. You see there on the left hand side, um, similar kind of thing, typical right in Melbourne. Um, and as we look at this, again in full speed, it's hard to see exactly what the problem is. If you're in, you know, used to laying this exams, you can see it okay, but as we look at this, we can see the right foot goes down, the head goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So a really nice way of being able to slow it down um, you can add it to the patient file, you can compare severity, you can compare improvements, a nice objective way of looking at that. So I really can't overstate the importance of using video to try and assess these um, gait abnormalities and, and seeing what's going on. Um, Piyush is a, a vet who's in um, India and he has come to visit the clinic and really nice thing about taking videos of lameness. He sent me one this week and ultimately from the video I couldn't tell exactly what the problem was. But you can even send those videos to us or other specialists and we can have a look and make an assessment and, and see if we can give some clues as to, to what the problems are as well. So really great uh, resource. You know, everyone has a smartphone in their pocket these days, so it's a really sure, easy um, This case is another one. Um, again, just highlighting very obvious lameness. This is the German Shepherd we were looking at previously. And this is a um, pretty obvious lameness here. You can slow it down again. Down, up, down, up. So that left front leg, obviously pretty sore and pretty uncomfortable for that point. 
Um, the next one we've got is looking at the back leg and we've got a couple of videos here again. So on the left, we look at it in full speed. We're just trying to get away from this on the lead there. Again, fairly obvious lameness, but again, slowing it down, you can see more clearly that as that right leg goes on the ground, it's really shifting that weight and that's the hip plate. So it's really trying to offload that right back leg, throwing all of his weight forwards as that right back leg goes on the ground, just to try and offload it, make it more comfortable. When we look at this um, patient on the right here, again, fairly obvious lameness, um, but again, full speed. Bit of a walk at the start and the trot. And you can see it becomes more obvious at the trot as well. But again, when I'm looking at these patients, I look at them as they walk away from me, look at them as they walk towards me, and I look at them as they're turning around and, and just try and get some clues all the way through. So we're looking for that hip bike again, and you can see as that left leg goes on the ground, the hips come up and he's trying to shift his weight forward to, to take that pain off that uh, left back leg. So that's a hip hike that we look for in the back leg. The first video we're looking at, obviously, um, the head bob, um, which is a pretty typical thing, pretty consistent thing um, for front leg lameness. This next one we're going to look at, this video came from a colleague of mine, Brian Beal, um, and I borrowed that off him. Really nice demonstration of a dog with a bunny hopping gait. Um, again, with the bunny hopping gait, um, we're looking at general hip problems. It's a pretty happy dog, still, even though he's got that bunny hopping gait, bringing both back legs forward at the same time. But that bunny hopping gait is very characteristic of a dog with um, pain in the hips. So again, looking at it more slowly, you can do a bit more information, looking at it full speed. So this is another dog here, another one of Brian's videos, which I borrowed from him. Um, a dog with just a stiff back leg gait. Just kind of slow to get up, pretty short stride, and just generally looks a little bit uncomfortable. He's not moving that free. So just look at that again. It's a bit of a hard time getting up right at the top there, having a hard time extending those hips. And then he's just pretty stiff moving around when he gets going. Another one uh, where we've got a dog with what we call pelvic and sway. And again, not so much a lameness, but you can really see those hips you know, swaying from side to side and that can be an indication. Again, and there's some discomfort in the hips and that's going to help us to know if, even if we're looking at something else, you know, the dog's got an obvious problem elsewhere, we can look at those hips and, and get a picture as to whether those joints are also affected and, and going to be a problem for this patient. So just kind of hold up there. Has anyone got any questions or comments at this point about um, what we talked about there with the videos and the visual assessment? Mm -hmm. Feel free to sing out if you have anything you want to say. After I can see, just waiting to say something. <laughs> no, okay. We'll keep moving through then. So we're gonna now, we've looked at the um, initial stages. We've looked at the orthopedic exam, neurologic examination. Ah, sorry, the um, passive observation of the posture and gait. We're gonna move on to now looking at the orthopedic examination. We'll go through some of those general principles and then we'll look at some of the specific manipulation. So. The general principles of the examination, um, I think it's really important to always remember that things come in pairs, um, in most cases, and this is an amputee. Um, so always look at both legs. So even if I'm worried about a left back leg laying this, I'm worried about a crucial rupture in the left, I'm always going to take a close look at what's going on the right side um, because it's not uncommon that we'll find a problem in there as well. Same goes for basically all the orthopedic diseases that we see. Um, it's possible for almost all of them to be um, a manifest bilaterally. And it's not uncommon that one is worse than the other one. And so there is an asymmetry there and we're focusing on that. Um, but then there's also another issue that we need to deal with. We want to look at all four legs. I think, again, it's important not to just focus on the one problem. We get a global assessment of what's going on and to try and understand what all the dog's problems are. So we can give the owners a good picture of what the issues are and we can go through a more detailed plan of, of how we're going to deal with all those specific problems. Generally, when we start looking at the legs, we're going to start distal, we're going to start at the toes, and we're going to work our way proximally. And as we do this, we're going to be looking at each joint and each bone, and we're wanting to assess things like instability, um, we're going to look for pain, and we're going to look for muscle mass and symmetry. Um, when we're looking at instability or lack of or stability, generally what we're looking for is either an increase in stability or instability, um, or a decrease in stability, which might occur when there's fibrosis. So if there's instability, then we're looking for um, some kind of structure that's failed, like a collateral ligament or a crucial ligament, something like that. 
um, if we've got reduced um, mobility and measurement stability, uh, sorry, fibrosis there, um, then that is also interesting. It suggests potentially more of a chronic problem, um, but both of those things can be abnormal. Um, obviously, a focal source of pain is really important and that can give us clues as to the next segment where we want to take our x-rays or perform our imaging. And as we talked about at the start, looking at muscle mass or symmetry can give us a clue again as to which leg might be a problem. And I think it's very important when we're looking at muscle mass and symmetry, really common scenario is that you have a dog with bilateral crucial disease and one of them has been a problem for a number of years, never been diagnosed or worked up or treated um, effectively. And then um, that one's been on and off playing, for instance, on the left side for a, you know, six months, or four months, I've got some muscle mass there, but all of a sudden the dog comes in and they're actually much more lame on the right side because they've had an acute injury in that side and the lame is much worse on that um, particular side. Um, we want to look at palpating all of the joints. We want to go through each of the phalanges. Um, we want to go through the um, metacarpal phalangeal joints. We're going to go through the carpus, the tarsus. We're going to move up through the elbow and knee. Um, we're going to look at the shoulder and the hip. We're going to look at you can look at all the muscles and just feel those things. And again, it seems like a lot to do, but when you are used to doing this consistently, you can get all of this done um, effectively um, in a really short you know, amount of time, doing it over a couple of minutes. Um, we often, when we're doing this, we want to be careful to start with a non painful limb first. Um, and again, this comes back to the temperament of the animal. If we all of a sudden just jump and grab the painful part of the dog first and we look at that, then it might be impossible then to actually get a meaningful assessment of the rest of the dog and, and what's actually sore and not sore because they, they sometimes will just react to everything at that point. Um, we want to consider whether we do the examination conscious. You know, most dogs are amenable to that. Sometimes it helps us to take the dog away from the owners and have one of the um, assistants or a, a, one of the nurses or techs hold on to the patient um, for you away from the, away from the owners um, and sometimes the dogs can behave quite differently at that point. Um, in some situations, what I'll reach for quite commonly is a minimum sedation. And the sedation is just to take the edge off the patient and take away um, the things that are annoying to the patient and leave, hopefully, then just the things that are actually truly painful. And that can hopefully, hopefully give us a clearer picture as to what the actual problem is. Uh, looking at the joints, um, as we talked about, we want to palpate each joint. We want to look at range of motion. Um, we want to look at in increased... Um, range of motion or range of motion in the wrong plane. Um, and in that situation, we're looking at that instability. We want to see if range of motion has decreased and whether there's fibrosis there. Um, we want to look at um, whether there is effusion um, or fibrosis. And in this case here on the bottom, we've got a um, situation where we've got both effusion and fibrosis. We've got medial buttress here. This is a bit of crucial rupture. Um, this top situation is relatively common thing. This is a large breed dog and um, this is um, what we call carpal laxity or puppy laxity syndrome and that is a transient problem and it often can present and be quite traumatic um, and so when we look at these guys the range of motion of these joints is actually fairly normal um, and there's no kind of valgus virus instabilities necessarily but there are changes in the amount of flexion and extension of the joints and, and they can vary quite a lot um, but generally these are cases um, that we see in large breed dogs that are growing rapidly um, and potentially haven't been on a really um, good uh, surface for walking around on. So things that are a little bit um, you know, slippery or things like that. And so the treatment is just conservative. They often don't need to be bandaged. Bandaging these guys is often a, a bad thing to do. Um, and often end up with secondary problems that are a real challenge to manage. And so um, we just model them closely and they often get better just with time. Next thing we're going to look at is muscle atrophy. So we can look for the muscle atrophy on this side. We can see that the left side is certainly much skinny than the right side around the thigh. Um, we can do it more objectively. We can look at um, thigh circumference using our fingers here. We can see as um, we've got our hands around the dog's thigh, we can't get our thumbs to touch here, but on the other side we can. Um, if we want to be more objective, we can use a tape measure and um, assess this. And we can use this, you know, physiotherapists and we have people use this um, measurement um, to assess how the rehab program's going and assess whether we're doing a good job or not. So all those things are possible um, and that's reported in, in various locations about how to do that and, and being consistent with the, the measurements that we take. I generally personally don't use a tape measure very often, if at all, um, I'm gonna be looking at just visual observation and, and palpation and symmetry left and right to see exactly what we've got going on. 
So that's the general principles. Um, has anyone got any questions on that at the moment? Any comments? No. Nothing really pressing from anyone. Okay. So the next thing we're going to look at. Um, is the specific manipulations um, and again some tips and tricks just looking at the, the front leg and the back leg here. So when we're looking at these joints, the first comment I want to make is that really, you know, common things occur commonly. So when we're looking at the thoracic limb, we are going to be focusing our attention mainly on the shoulder and the elbow because those two joints will account for probably 90% or more of the lamest cases that we're going to see. When we're looking at the back leg, um, we think about the hip and the stifle and they're the most important joints to assess first and, and to rule problems out for first because, again, they will account for probably 90 or more percent of the, um, the problems that we're going to see in the back leg. So common things occur commonly. When we look at these guys, um, there are potentially issues if we're doing you know, flexion extension of a particular joint. And the problem is that when we are manipulating one joint, inadvertently we're also manipulating another joint. And we see this in the front leg when we're trying to look at either the shoulder or the elbow, if we run through a range of motion, if we extend the elbow, it's often hard to do that and not um, inadvertently extend the, um, the shoulder to some degree, same with flexion. And so it's important to be aware of that, that you know, manipulating one joint can manipulate another joint and, and cause a pain reaction. But you know, we might be focusing on the shoulder, but the, the problem is actually still on the elbow. Same thing occurs in the back leg. And in this example here, we're looking at maybe a couple of issues. You know, if we've got um, a dog we're looking at for either lumbar sacral disease, or potentially for a hip problem, we're going to extend that hip. Um, and in extending that hip, you know, that can create pain in the hip joint. Once we get to the end of range of motion, the problem is that when we fully extend that hip joint, we also are extending that stifle joint. And if this dog has cruciate disease, then it's possible that the dog's reacting because of the cruciate disease, excuse me, and not um, just the hip disease. The other problem is that, you know, we're trying to focus in on the hip here, but in um, extending the back leg and extending the hip joint, we're also um, extending the um, L7, S1 uh, vertebral body um, and that intervertebral space, and that can cause discomfort for a dog that's got lumbar sacral disease. So all of those things need to be considered. Um, and I put in this comment there about just being careful with interpretation and, you know, this idea of white coat fever, dogs being really wound up, um, you know, you have to be careful what you're interpreting as being truly painful, um, versus something that the dog just doesn't like. Um, you know, we can get around that a little bit by looking before touching. I think we've hit that point home pretty hard. Um, and then also that um, idea of sedation. And, and if I'm gonna use sedation to give you an idea of the, the level of sedation that I'm looking for, um, we're gonna be using ACE promazine, generally at 0 0.02 milligrams per kilogram, and then butorphanol somewhere between 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. And this is a relatively light um, amount of sedation, but it does help to take the edge off. Now, there are obviously some dogs that are going to still be bouncing off the walls with that amount of sedation, and, and that's not going to be enough, but that's a, a reasonable kind of starting point. When we look at the elbow, what do I look at specifically here? Um, the movements that I find most meaningful, um, I really wanted to look at extension of the elbow. Um, when we do flexion, we talk about potentially supinating or pronating the carpus as we do that, and that can sometimes highlight a problem. But for me, the most consistent thing is going to be pain with extension and then also pain with medial palpation. And what I'm doing there is palpating directly over the medial coronary process. And if I have those two things occurring, then I'm going to be looking very closely for either elbow arthritis in an older patient or elbow dysplasia um, in, a, in a younger dog. And those two things for me are the, the most consistent. I know that other surgeons talk a lot about pain with deflection and, and having a clear difference between supination and pronation, but in my hands, I haven't found that to be a really useful thing and, and really consistent. Maybe I'm not doing it the right way that they, um, they talk about. So that's the elbow. When we look at the shoulder, um, really important things to look for are muscle atrophy. Um, and again, this is where it's important to think about the age of the patient. You know, if it's a younger animal, we're going to be looking at things like OCD. 
if it's an older patient, um, the thing that's going to come up as an important thing that is going to be medial shoulder instability. So um, with both of those situations, we're going to see muscle atrophy. Generally, with the, the medial shoulder instability cases, um, that is a, a very prominent feature. And we're palpating specifically the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles and the scapular spine to see um, if there's any asymmetry between left and right side, if there's just any generalised atrophy that's bilateral. And looking at range of motion, the shoulder's a tricky one. And I think front leg lameness, I'd make a comment here, I think front leg lameness is much more difficult generally than back leg lameness. Um, firstly, trying to isolate which joint's affected is more problematic. And then once we even identify what the problem is, I think that the options for treatment are not as clear as what we've got in the back leg. You know, if you've got a back leg problem, it's in the knee, it's a cruciate, we can fix that pretty well. If it's a hip, you know, we've got options there. We can leave with a hip replacement, that does work pretty well. You know, if we've got elbow arthritis, elbow dysplasia, you know, what's the best option for treating elbow dysplasia? Um, that depends who you ask. <laughs> Um, and that, that is sometimes a, a really challenging thing to know for sure. What's the best thing for treating elbow arthritis once the dysplasia is developed into arthritis? You know, again, that becomes a bit of a can of worms. And, and I think that most surgeons have their own opinions on that and, and what they think works well. Um, I'm not going to go into a big discussion about that, but there's, a, there's certainly a lot more controversy about the front leg than, than the back leg. Same with the shoulder. Um, this idea of medial shoulder instability is one that came up probably about 10 years ago. It was really first identified. Um, down a lot of traction. We see a lot of it here, um, and it's a difficult one to diagnose with anything short of arthroscopy. Um, you know, even doing an MRI can be difficult to make a definitive diagnosis. What we're trying to get at with the physical examination is, you know, in my opinion, are we dealing with the shoulder or the elbow? Which of these joints are we going to take um, radiographs of or, or do imaging of? And in some situations, honestly, it's really hard to know, and it's not uncommon for us to have a shellbow case which comes in, and, and a shellbow is one where we're going to look at both the elbow and the shoulder. Um, and we're often going to look at them both with imaging, sometimes x-rays, add on the CT scan, and then oftentimes I'm putting a scope in both as well to get a handle on exactly what the problem is because it can be really hard to know exactly which is the, the main issue. And honestly, more often than not, when I pop a, a scope in both the elbow and the shoulder, guess what? We see that there's arthritis in both. Um, and then we have to wonder about which is the, the most significant problem for that particular patient. And again, that can be a hard thing to understand completely. What we do for treatment then depends a lot on the owner's expectations and issues, how bad the dog is, where the relative problems are in the joint. Um, the treatment for these guys, an older patient, for instance, where we've got arthritis in both joints, um, I personally use a lot of stem cells and <coughs> plasma. Um, and then potentially we're looking at surgical options for stabilisation, depending on exactly what we find. Um, so don't guess a little bit there, but I think there's some important comments to make. Um, when we come back and look at the shoulder assessment specifically um, and the challenges there, you know, we can look at range of motion with the shoulder, you know, looking at flexion extension. In some cases, we're going to look for the abduction angle. So this is the abduction angle here. What we're doing is we've got our hand pushing down on the scapular spine and then we're taking our antebrachium and we're trying to lift that antebrachium away from the patient, um, adducting it, and we're trying to see what this angle is here. Okay, and there's normal reference ranges reported. Um, I don't. I used to look at the actual specific angle a lot. I don't look at the specific number of the angle much anymore. If I get pain in the shoulder, um, I'm often going to be looking at you know, putting a camera in there and having a look around because I think I can get a, a meaningful assessment of what's going on there. I do look at the angle subjectively here. Sometimes you'll see that left versus right side. There's a, a difference, um, but. Um, in some cases, it's a, it's a difficult test to interpret. If you've got a lot of muscle atrophy around the shoulder joint, then you might have an artifactually increased angle. Um, but sometimes it, it can be a useful thing to do. It's, it's one of these things that's it's worth knowing about. It's worth having it in your kind of spectrum of tests that we can assess and look at um, as part of the workup. But it's not one that I put as much weight on now as I, I guess I used to do. The other thing that I find more um, useful is the biceps test. I'll run through that in just a second. Um, and then also palpation and palpation around the, the biceps um, tendon on the kind of cradial medial aspect of the shoulder can be um, a useful thing. And also sometimes palpation specifically over the supraspinatus muscle. Um, if you've got any supraspinatus tendinopathy or um, inflammation, that can be um, a useful thing to look at as well. But again, it's a challenging joint. It's not like the cruciate in the stifle joint where we can test for cranial jaw. And people talk about testing for jaw in the shoulder, but I think that that's a, a challenging 
willing to make any meaningful and consistent um, interpretation of. And so really what I'm trying to find out at the end of the day is, is there pain in the shoulder with any of these tests? Is there maybe an increase in abduction angle? If there is, and I'm going to look more closely at what I need to do there. And oftentimes, you know, I'm in a referral hospital by the time the patient comes to see me, you're looking at putting a scope in the joint to, to see what's going on and um, see how bad things is, and that's going to direct our, our treatment from there. So does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any questions on assessment of the shoulder? Um, it's a great opportunity. I know there's a lot of controversy here. Um, I would really encourage you to have any questions just to fire them at me now if, you, if there's something you want to know about. So this is going to be on the chat screen. There's nothing on the chat, so that's great. We'll keep moving through. So this is a video um, of um, actually my mum and dad's dog, who's a um, labradoodle who has a sore shoulder. And this is actually under anaesthetic. Um, she wouldn't let me do this to her awake. And so what we're doing with this biceps test, a couple of things. So just let the video play through here and then I'll talk about what we're doing. So a um, couple of movements are important. When we come back to the start here, the first thing we're gonna do, the first comment I guess to make is that the biceps muscle actually starts up here on the glenoid. It then crosses the shoulder joint here, makes up the bulk of the muscle in this location, and then it inserts actually on the radius and the ulna down here. So the biceps unit actually crosses both the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. And to assess the biceps unit um, completely, we need to stretch it right out. And to do that effectively, we want to basically do two things. We want to flex that shoulder, so we put the shoulder in maximal flexion. And then once we've done that, we're actually going to extend the elbow joint. Okay, and so you can see as we go through here, I'm just trying to grab that, we flex the shoulder, and then we extend that elbow. And once we extend that elbow right out, we're going to stretch that um, biceps tendon all the way to its long length. And the other thing we can do while we're stretching is actually palpate medially here over that biceps tendon. Um, and often if you have a problem either in the medial compartment or in the biceps tendon specifically, that'll make the dog jump pretty good. Um, not every time, but it's a, it's a pretty consistent test, especially when you're looking at biceps problems. What's interesting though, is that I've certainly been misled by this test in that um, I've gone into the shoulder thinking that we're gonna have a problem there, drop the scope in there and everything's completely normal. And then we shift, we gotta go back to the drawing board and we come back and we look at the elbow joint and there's actually pain in the elbow joint. And what can happen is that when we put um, pressure on that biceps tendon insertion, that can actually cause the coronal process of the ulna to push on the humerus and it can get conflict there and that can cause discomfort. And so in some situations, um, if we think that's the problem, we'll do a biceps ulna release as part of a treatment for elbow dysplasia. So there's a few things to think about um, when we're looking at that biceps tendon. Again, do you guys have any questions on that at the moment? Is there anything that I can answer? Have you guys tried to do that before? Okay. So we'll move on to the next slide then. Um, and we're going to go from the front leg, we're going to start looking at the back leg. You've seen this image before. Um, when we're looking at the hip, what kind of movements are we looking at specifically here? What are we, what are we considering? Um, we're going to look at muscle mass, we're going to look at range of motion and we're going to look at range of motion, we're going to look um, at extension and adduction of the hip. Um, I think it's nice to consider again when we extend the hip if it's painful there, um, you know, think about LS disease, think about the stifle. If we do adduction of the hip, so we're doing the hip out this way, um, then that can give us more clues that the hip is the problem um, and not something else. So if they're not painful on adduction or on extension, then that should just alert you the fact that there might be something else going on. When we're looking at instability, the really um, well-known test that we wanted to look for there is the autoarm sign. I'll show some videos of that on this slide here. So again, I've got this one from Brian Deal. Um, he's made some great videos and he's happy for us to, to use those. So what we're looking for, just let the video play through, but we basically, when we do this, we're applying an axial force on the femur um, with our right hand here. We're trying to subluxate that hip. And then as we abduct, um, sorry, add up, so I've got that, um, as we abduct that stifle, um, we're going to see that that gravity clamp will actually drop back down into the, um, the hip joint. So we're putting an axial force along the hip 
And as we add up, so add the up to the, um, the stifle, we can see that data trafan did drop down right about here. So that's going from being subluxated to reduced. Subluxated, reduced. And we can keep looking at that. So as we go um, to being reduced, as we come back this way, we wanted to check the angle of the subluxation. And so we look at um, an idea of what that angle is. And when we're making assessments for doing procedures like the double pelvic osteotomy, um, we are wanting to assess the angle of um, reduction and the angle of subluxation as part of that um, kind of analysis of data to decide whether these patients are going to be a good candidate for that procedure or not. Um, but to just simply say, you know, has the dog got laxity, um, has it got hip dysplasia, the autolining test can be a really great way to do that. Now, like all tests, it's not perfect. In some situations, if you've got really um, a badly worn out dorsal acetabular limb, and so there's a lot of fibrosis there, you might not actually have a really crisp autolining sign. So you might be able to um, subluxate that hip. And then as you go to try and reduce it um, by pulling the, the stifle away from the, the body, it may um, either not reduce very well if it, the hip's completely subluxated, or um, it might reduce and you may not feel it reduce. It may not have that crisp kind of popping sensation that can happen because of the fibrosis and wear around the dorsal acetabular limb. But that's a really pretty nice test, pretty easy to do. Um, it does require the patient being under sedation or general anesthetic when we do that um, because we need to make sure there's no tension in the muscles that can um, make interpretation more challenging. So we're getting a bit short on time there. So when we're looking at the autolani sign again, we're going to try and quantify that. We can do the autolani sign on their back. So on their side, as you've got in this video, we can do it on their back. Um, and then the device that we've got here is actually a goniometer. And so this goniometer is used to assess the angles of reduction and subluxation. So in this case here, the angle of reduction is 29 degrees. As we bring the, um, the cycle closer to the midline of the body, you can see the angle of subluxation is 14 degrees. And those numbers are useful um, when we're actually checking um, for whether candidates are going to be, or cases will be a candidate for um, the double pelvic osteotomy or triple pelvic osteotomy. So again, just some more um, information about that in this slide here. Um, looking at the angle of reduction. So as we bring this here and we're um, adapting that cycle away from the body, we can see that from vertical to here, that's the angle of reduction occurs. Um, and then on this, as we come back the other way, looking at the cycle towards midline, we can see that angle of subluxation. And so those are the numbers that we're going to look for. So to give you a bit more detail here, um, that angle of reduction is related to the passive joint laxity in the hip and it's related to the distraction index. Um, okay. The angle of subluxation um, is really an indication of active joint laxity and that's correlated to that dorsal acetabular limb as we talked about. Um, and so if we have a case where we have an angle of subluxation greater than 20 degrees, um, then we are looking at a dog that's got parts of the hip Okay. The other comment I just want to make, we touched on this already, um, is this when we're looking at the, the back legs and looking at this lordosis test. Um, lordosis test is where we're actually trying to um, hyperextend the, um, the L7S1 vertebral bodies, that, um, that junction there. Um, what can happen, and we're demonstrating here on the left versus the right, is that as we, this is the, the spinal cord in a, a fairly neutral position. So at L7S1, we've got ventral spondylosis, we've got a viscous here. Right. And so we get in the spinous processes in a normal kind of neutral position. And if you imagine the spinal cord down here, what we're going through here is that as we try and extend this hip, so as we bring this hip um, into extension, what we're inadvertently going to do is extend this um, L7S1 space. When doing that, two things happen. One is that we can cause the, um, the disc to bulge a lot more significantly. And you can see that um, we've extended this. We look at the distance between L7 and S1 here. But this disc bulges much more, but also the foramina, the L7 and S1 foramina on each side will be much, much narrow and they can actually cause impingement of the nerve roots as they come through that location. So again, just another um, message about the fact that when we're looking for you know examining one joint like the hip, we can actually cause problems in another joint and that can be misleading in our interpretation. 
So the is uh, test specifically um, what we're doing here is, is hip extension, heavy drop, LS pain or hip pain. That lordosis test can help to eliminate um, the hips as being a part of that equation because rather than having the hip extended and pushing down, they're actually flexing those hips up and then they're pushing down in that location focally to see if there's just focal extension of that LS uh, junction and whether it's pain specifically related to that. And this doesn't put any pressure on the hip joint. That all makes sense to everyone. So we're going to go a little bit over time with this time an hour now, but I've got a, a little bit more to go through just with the cycling and stuff's also important. So you do need to go um, do that. Um, if you want to stick around and, and just hear what we've got here, then that's great. So we'll just look through this. So with cycle assessment, a couple of things you want to look for. Um, the first thing is looking for buttress. Second thing is looking for effusion. Um, the third thing is looking for pain bite extension. And then when we look at um, the knee as well, we want to assess the patella, make sure this dog doesn't have a concurrent pain occlusion, ligament rupture, um, and a patella luxation. When we're looking at the patella, the two things I want to look for is whether the patella can luxate or not, what grade is it, but also this idea of patella pain. And so if we actually just push on the patella um, from a kind of cranial to portal direction with it in place, if there's a painful response when we do that, then it can be an indication that we've actually got erosion of the cartilage on the um, articular surface of the patella. And that can be quite a painful thing to deal with. So we diagnose a crucial problem. I just want you to remember that cranial draw is really only one piece of the puzzle, okay? And cranial draw is great if we've got a complete rupture because it's a very easy test. It's there, it's not. Um, I think we all probably understand pretty well how to assess cranial draw. Um, but that's only one part of the problem. And the cranial jaw doesn't help as much if we've got a partial rupture. And in my practice, we see um, just as many partial ruptures of the cruciate ligament, whether it's enhanced stability of the joint, compared to complete ruptures. So cranial jaw is just one piece of the puzzle. The other things we want to look for are the piece of the puzzle. are going to be, is there effusion on the stifling? Now, can we feel the effusion? Can we see that on a radiograph? Is there medial buttress? If you guys um, start looking for medial buttress in every case that you see, then pretty quickly you'll be able to pick that up when it's a subtle finding. But medial buttress is where we've got fibrosis in the joint capsule on the medial aspect of the tibia. And if you feel your own knee is providing you have a crucial rupture, you can feel a little indentation between your tibial um, plateau and your femoral condyle. And if you actually feel that in dogs, um, you'll feel that very readily in a normal animal. As soon as you start to lose that little indentation between the femur and the tibia, then that suggests that you've actually now got some, um, some buttress starting to develop there, and that can be a clue um, of an early partial tear in the crucial ligament. The third thing here, which is pain on hyperextension, you know, this is the one that to me is probably the most reliable. If you hyperextend a dog's knee and they've got a partial cruciate, it doesn't matter if it's a very, very early partial cruciate tear, that, um, that dog will generally jump um, pretty significantly if we hyperextend that knee. So we can couple that with a sit test. So when we're looking at these guys that don't want to sit squarely, they sit off to the side. Um, and so just jumping ahead of myself there. So when we look at the sit test, a normal dog will sit with both stifles in full flexion like this. If we see that the dogs are kind of leaning off to the side like this, this dog doesn't want to completely flex this stifle because it hurts, okay? And so if we see them failing this sit test, then that is, a, a, you know, again, another subtle sign and something to be aware of that can be a clue that they've got a, a, a crucial ligament problem. Again, don't underestimate that distance exam at rest. You know, fail the sit test here, fail the sit test here, the right leg, the left leg, um, they don't want to flex those knees. How do we test training, cranial draw just to run through that? Um, again, just review, you know, positive cranial draw indicates kind of tibial instability. Um, and we're looking at the, um, the tibia relative to the femur. It's very specific from the cruciate disease. Remember that in normal dogs, we can have um, one to two millimeters of draw in a normal situation, um, but it should have a fairly defined end point. So it should just stop. Um, we can have up to three millimeters of draw in puppies. If you have a cruciate rupture, then we have a lot more draw. And in some dogs, you'll have up to 15 millimeters. Okay, and that's, that's obviously quite a dramatic amount. So the landmarks we're looking for, um, Again, these are all pretty consistent. I'm sure this is reviewed, but just to run through it, we're looking for, um, over here, we've got the patella. And you want to, when you assess cranial draw, you want to have your fingers on the bony landmarks. No point having your fingers in the soft tissues here. So we've got one finger on the patella. We've got one on the fibella. So in our left hand, we're going to go onto those in the index finger and your thumb. And then just below that, we've got the tibial tuberosity and we've got the fibula head. 
So we're going to have one hand on the tibial tuberosa and fibular head, one hand on the patella and the fibella. Um, and generally, I'm going to do this in the patient in lateral recumbency. You can do it standing, but um, if it's not clear that the patient's not cooperating, um, doing lateral recumbency, doing it under general anaesthetic is, is a really easy way to assess that. And then we're going to just apply cranial force to the tibia. So it sort of looks like in a video. Um, it's pretty clear this dog's got a very sloppy neck. So this is a complete tear. This is a fairly cute rupture. So there's a lot of instability there. So we can run through that again. Um, let's pause that here. So we've got, in our right hand, we're looking at the left leg of the dog. We've got one thumb on the fibella, one finger on the patella, one finger on the tibial tuberosity, one on the fibula head, and we are moving it here relative to the femur. So we can see how unstable that is. So, <laughs> Things to be aware of, again, not every test is 100% 100% um, of the time. And so we've got um, possibly a negative test when you have a chronic cruciate rupture that can be because of periarticular fibrosis. Um, if there's hamstring contraction, that can counter the instability. And so that's why sometimes it's nice to perform these tests under sedation, under general anaesthetic. And also if you have a partial cruciate tear, then, um, you know, it's a hard to interpret thing. So we're not just relying on that cranial all, we're going to be looking at those other clues, um, whether we've got a fusion or buttress or cranial pipe extension. So that's the cruciate stuff. Does that all make sense to you guys? It's all pretty clear. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to fire away. We're being very quiet today. I've got my on. Um, okay, so if you have any questions, I'll just move along the last couple of slides. So the last kind of comment I wanted to make here is just that that don't forget to do a neurological assessment. Um, with my neurologic assessment, I'm certain that I don't do as thorough a neurologic assessment as a neurologist would, but for me, the, the most important things to look for, you know, when I'm doing my visual assessment, is there any ataxia? Um, you know, when I'm looking at the dogs walking around in a circle, are they stumbling, are they dragging their feet? Um, you know, if dogs have um, ataxia, then there's a neurologic component to the disease. If they just have a purely orthopedic problem, then they're not gonna be ataxic, they're not gonna have um, you know, you know, placing reactions, defects in there, um, you know, oh, defects. Oh. Yeah, so, oh. you want to look for <laughs> okay. so, yeah, back side, top circles, wide circles, left side, right side can help to highlight problems there. Um, you want to look for the type of gait. Is it a short, choppy kind of gait, or is it a long, loping kind of gait? Those small busy clues is there being a problem. Um, we wanted to look at placing reactions, so I mean, I just with all four legs, place them over with the, the, um, the foot on the dorsum and see what kind of response we get. Um, sometimes it can help, and I find it more useful in little dogs, to, if you're not sure, to, to put their foot on a piece of paper, um, like oh. an A4 piece of paper, and just slowly draw that piece of paper away from them. So, um, you know, drawing that foot from a normal standing posture, to draw that foot in there, um, and try and adapt it from the body. And if you can add that from the body and don't realise, then actually try and correct it, then that can be a more subtle sign that there's a, a um, proprioceptive deficit there. I'm going to look at the palpation of the spine, we're going to look at the survival spine, throughout the lumbar, lumbar sacral, we talked about the neurosis test already. Um, yep. And we look at the neck, I generally move the head from you know, left to right lateral flexion, dorsal, ventral. Um, and I'm also going to be um, careful to really palpate nice and deep up in the axilla on the front leg. And also palpating along the iliac psoas muscle. So if you look at the back leg right here, um, the iliac psoas muscle runs in here from the kind of lumbar spine down to attach them to the um, lesser uh, trachanda femur. And those are, you know, if you've got an every tumor or something like that, that's a common location, a common area that we're going to see pain with those particular cases. Um, so the reflexes, the spinal reflexes. I don't put much weight in the spinal reflexes on the front leg because they're very inconsistent. I do assess these. Um, all the time in the back, they're looking at the patella and the sciatic nerve, and also looking at the withdrawal reflex. And you can look at withdrawal on all four legs as well. So, again, what are the traps? What do we think of? Um, you know, more mistakes are made by not looking rather than not knowing. I think that's a really important thing to take home from this. A lot of mistakes are made by not listening to the owner or not listening to the owner that has accurate information. Um, and so, interpreting owners, I think that's a lifelong skill that we develop with time. Um, you also make a lot of mistakes by just assuming things are happening. And so, again, it's important not just to make a really rapid assessment and assume that that's the only problem. 
do a thorough assessment every time, make sure you don't miss anything. Ensure that of a large number of animals, that you are not going to be made to look like a fool by missing something. Um, don't ignore the stigma and the history. Um, you know, pay attention to that stuff before you walk into the consult. Um, have all those things kind of playing through your mind as to what might be going on, but don't be completely blind to and focus on those things that you forget about other things that could be going on. Yeah, I the other thing I'd say is really avoid the temptation to take radiographs and know the fact it's from the radiographs. Um, you, know, you should be taking x-rays of a joint that you think is a problem rather than just trying to look for the needle in the haystack. Because as we demonstrated with that very first case where we just took x-rays of the hip and we saw hip arthritis and we referred the case for a hip replacement, that dog actually had a crucial rupture that was a problem that we needed to fix. So all of those things are really, really important. Um, you know, I think it's a important to be aware of these traps when you are starting out as a, a new grad or someone with less experience because you know you are um, potentially more nervous or anxious about um, you know missing things it's really important when we get later in our career and, and this is certainly something when you've been out 5 10 15 20 whatever years that you um, resist the temptation to cut corners at that point also because um, you have um, ideas and, and mindset about what could be going on and, and you know you might miss something that um, is there that you haven't looked thoroughly enough to find. So take homes, um, again, first don't touch the patient. Okay, be consistent. Um, remember common things occur commonly um, and remember some of those specific movements for specific joints and, and some of the traps that we fall into in order to those particular areas. So that's all I have for you guys. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, now, I just yeah, want to thank you guys again for, for joining us. Um, it's a good number of you there today. Um, hopefully what we went through was um, interesting and of use for you. Um, if you guys have any questions at all, any comments, um, now's a great opportunity to talk to, um, talk to me about anything related to this stuff. Um, the, it's also a really good opportunity if you guys are using Vet Dojo um, to give us any feedback. We, um, it's a new learning platform for Charles and myself. We uh, wanted to get it out there. We're producing more content all the time. Um, we want to get your feedback on what you think of the courses. Um, if there's content in there that you like or don't like, things you want to include, um, then certainly do feel free to let us know. Um, with these round sessions, um, myself and Charles are going to host these really once a week. Um, and again, we are open to your input as to what we talk about for these. Um, we sometimes struggle for inspiration when we do these ones. So if you have stuff you want us to talk about, then, then, just, um, then just let us know. So I've got a couple of questions here, um, one from Scully. Um, so do we routinely test spinal reflexes if you have normal CPs and ataxia if you're expecting neurologic disease? Um, that's a great question. If I'm suspicious of neurologic disease, then I do look at the um, spinal reflexes at that point. Why? My experience generally is though that um, the dogs are generally going to start to show um, signs of ataxia um, fairly early on when there's a problem in the spinal cord. That's one of the first things that we see. So um, if there's no ataxia, then it's unlikely to be um, a neurologic problem. But I, think, I still think it's part of that examination and worthwhile exercise to do that to assess the, the spinal reflexes as well. Um, and then there's another question from Kuthan. Um, can I comment on tips for palpating neonates and juveniles? I'm always unsure due to the lax of their joints, especially kittens. Yeah, I mean, young dogs and cats are, are really, really difficult. Um, they don't necessarily uh, respond as consistently to manipulations as, as adult dogs. Um, and there are certainly challenges, not only when we look at them physically on the physical exam, also when we're looking at radiographs with joint, uh, with, sorry, with growth plates and things like that are open. So I don't have any specific tips or tricks. I think actually cats in particular are really difficult um, creatures to do orthopedic exams on. Um, for one, almost every time when we're trying to do a visual observation and, and look at them moving around the room, they either don't want to come out of their cage or when they come out of the cage, they kind of just sit there and eyeball you and <laughs> they don't want to do much. Um, sometimes it can help to you know, take them away from their owner and let them walk around the room, but it can be a really difficult way to try and assess them. And, and cats in general, I mean, we're often, it's not many owners that are taking their cat for a walk on their lead to see that they're actually lying. You know, cats present in a very different way. They're often more reluctant to move around generally. They're, um, you know, they're just less active, less wanting to play, and they're often the clues we look for from the start. So 
Um, nothing specific. I think it's really more important in those cases to, to be aware of um, what the owners are saying and, and, and even trying to get some footage and video from, from when they're at home. Um, so to answer that question specifically, no specific tips and tricks, just um, obviously if you're, if you're concerned about um, instabilities or pain, then to just check left and right side to try and get a baseline for what might be normal. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I'd say from there. Thank you, James. And Robert said, great talk and don't forget pano. Um, I think that's absolutely true. Panosiotis is something that we do see commonly and, and something that, that can be easily overlooked. So um, helping those long bones, yeah, can be, um, can be very useful. So thanks, Pirish. Uh, great to see you again, my friend. Um, hope you're keeping well over in India. Um, and thank you everyone for coming to join us today. Um, really nice to see you all here and um, yeah, very happy that we've got a, a, a nice wide reach with this stuff and, and we're getting a lot of interest. So thank you guys and we'll see you soon.